in here tonight. Can you hear me okay? Well, before I get started, I want to do a brief uh, commercial um, because um, I just I was recently commissioned by the University of Kentucky to write a short play based on the photography of uh, Ralph Eugene Meatyard. And right now there's a great exhibit of Meatyard's work at the UK Art Museum. And so I wrote a play called Fault Space. It's one of two plays that, they've, uh, that they're doing three times. The next time is on October 21st, and I saw it recently, and I was just so blown away by what the cast and crew had done. I want to encourage everybody to go. And even if you don't get to see the play, go see the Meat Yard exhibit, because it's, it's really moving and weird, and uh, just makes you think. Uh, it was great fodder for uh, I had to write a play based on four of his photographs, and uh, at first I thought I'll never be able to do this. Now though, I have so much, I can't fit this in 20 minutes. But anyway, it's a great production, so I hope you'll see it October 21st at 2 p.m., I believe. Um, I also want to thank uh, the university and the English department, MFA, Hannah in particular, for working with me to get here. Um, it's the first time I've been at UK in like 15 years, so I'm glad to be back. Um, and thank y'all for spending the evening with me. I'm just going to read to you for about 20 minutes, and then I'd love for us to have a conversation. Um, so please talk to me. Um, I'm going to talk whether you talk to me or not, so it would be better if you were this way. Um, well, Southernmost starts um, the weekend that marriage equality was passed by the Supreme Court. And the same weekend, the devastating flood hits the community of Cumberland Valley, Tennessee. And the people, a lot of the people in the community blame the devastating flood on, on that Supreme Court decision. We've all probably heard it's on the radio say, this hurricane happened because of such and such, et cetera. Um, over the last 10 years, Asher Sharp, uh, a pastor, a small fundamentalist church in town has been really examining himself and what he thinks about this issue because his brother came out to him and he rejected him in a really terrible way and then his brother disappeared. <coughs> so for about 10 years he's been uh, reevaluating what he really believes in. So when the flood happens and um, the, these two gay men come to his house and he, he wants to be good to them but his wife turns them away, he he knows that this is a moment in his life that he has to stand up for what he believes in. And so in that way, I think the book is more relevant now than it was when I was writing it, because I think over the last couple of years and as we go forward, more and more of us have had to stand up and, and really articulate what we believe in instead of just sort of being quiet about it. Um, also, I think it's more relevant because I think for a long time, uh, LGB, LGBT people and people who are the other in, in whatever way you want to think about it, have often had this constant question of how do I go on loving people who have a fundamental disagreement with me about what makes a good human being? Well, now I think just about everybody has that question to some degree, no matter what side of the aisle you come down on, um, particularly on one side of the aisle, I think. <laughs> but, um, so I, th those are the sorts of things I was thinking about while I was writing the book. Um, the book was finished in 2015 when marriage equality passed, so I had to rewrite the book. To make, and it, it just made it that much more timely because even though marriage equality was passed, um, there was still so much further to go and so many more battles to fight. And so it was a really easy revision because thematically it was already there. I just had to go back and you know, put a few little details in to rewrite it. But I'm just going to read you the opening of the book. However, I'll be skipping around a little bit so this isn't the way you would read it in the novel. The rain had been falling with a pounding meanness without ceasing for two days, and then the water rose all at once in the middle of the night. A brutal rush so fast, Asher thought at first a dam might have broken somewhere upstream. The ground had simply become so saturated it could not hold any more water. 
All the creeks were conspiring down the ridges until they washed out into a cumberland. There was no use in anyone going to bed because they all knew what was going to happen. They only had to wait. The day dawned without any sign of sun, a sky that groaned open from a black night to a dull purpling gray of morning. And Asher went out to walk the ridge and get a full eye on the situation. There he saw the massively swollen river supping at the edges of the lower fields, ten feet above its own banks, a foamy brawl climbing so steadily he could actually see its ascent. <laughs> Theirs was one of the lucky houses, situated on the ridge where the water could reach them, although the river was far too close to put him at ease. The last flood had destroyed so much, but it had not threatened them. This one was licking awfully close, and if the rain kept falling, the Cumberland would have no choice but to keep rising until the water was seeping into their home. His church had been built on the highest point in those parts more than a hundred years before, but many in his congregation would be homeless. Some of them had only recently rebuilt from the last flood. He had no idea how he would handle all the care they would need. Throughout the day, his mother-in-law Zelda and his wife Lydia watched the useless television news while Asher and Justin watched the river rise, watched the rain fall. Justin would not leave his side. Are we going to be okay? He asked. His green eyes latched onto Asher's green eyes. Yes, buddy, Asher said. Don't you worry now. But Asher was worried. Even worse than the rising water, even worse than the fact that he had not heard one siren or seen one helicopter or any sign of help from the government, even worse was that Lydia was doing nothing but praying in the shadowy cave of her room. Even worse than that was that they couldn't find Roscoe anywhere. He imagined the worst possibilities. Roscoe being swept away in the flood, his little front legs paddling furiously to stay afloat. Even worse, Roscoe washed ashore somewhere, drowned, no more. This was one reason prayer was so hard for Asher these days. Stillness was a danger for him, causing his mind to conjure the worst scenarios and dreads. He roamed back and forth beneath the cover of the porch, hands cupped around his mouth, hollering the little dog's name. He kept expecting Roscoe to race into the yard, zigzagging around the three dogwoods in his showing off way, and then skip up the steps and wind his wet body between Asher's legs, jumping up to lick Justin on the mat. But the dog did not come. He probably got turned around because of the water being over his path, Asher said to Justin when he came out. They both knew of Roscoe's love for waiting in the shoals in the mornings, rain or not. Asher found himself lying to his son again, something he had promised himself he would never do. He's smart. He'll find his way back. Justin turned his attention back to the sopping yard. He squinted his eyes to see through the spears of rain, watching for his dog. Asher went back out to help the closest neighbors, but there was nothing to do except watch their lives float away. This one is too much, they said. This one feels like a judgment. They stood on the ridges together as the night gathered in, black and thick. The electricity was off as far as they could see, a total darkness unlike any Asher had ever known. He wondered about the two men he had seen earlier and felt guilty that he had not offered them a ride while some of the roads were still navigable. Nobody would be going anywhere now. Back home, they all sat in the living room without saying much. There was little to be said. Justin slept off and on, leaned against Asher on the couch, but he awoke at the slightest sound. Around midnight, the rain only fell in thin lines for a time, and then it stopped, just like that, like someone had snapped their fingers. Now, they could hear the roaring river turning with trees and houses and animals. They might have heard the cries of calves or the terrified whinnies of horses right through the walls of the house itself, but all the other debris was too loud for that, a cacophony of loss. They didn't know it yet, but the flood had killed more than 40 people, and soon, once the floodwaters began to drop, corpses would be revealed in the treetops, trapped in houses 
washed up on the banks of the river. Now that night had capped itself down around the world, Justin had grown more upset and was unable to go back to sleep. I can't stand it, Justin said. There were tears in his eyes. He's lost out there. He was struggling not to shed the tears. Sometimes Asher worried the boy might always be able to get along better with animals than other people. Other times he thought that might not be such a bad fate. If there was anything he had learned so far in life, it was that dogs often made better friends than folks did anyway. It's all right, buddy, Asher said, patting his small back. He'll make it home. As long as he kept telling Justin everything was okay, everything would be okay. He felt his own assurances might be the only thing holding the entire world together. Hush crying now, honey, Lydia said, her voice sudden and stark in the darkness. Her face was lit with the glow from the candles. Boys don't cry and go on like that. Asher set his eyes on her in a way to warn her against saying more. Why shouldn't the boy be able to grieve over his little dog? Zelda looked from Asher to her daughter, letting them both know that this was no night to argue. Lydia made her voice tender, quieter. If he doesn't toughen up, I'm afraid the world will eat him alive. Asher rose and took his son with him out on the porch. They stood, listening to the moan and groan of the impregnated river. No lights anywhere. The threatening convulsions of lightning way off in the distance back toward Nashville. Asher looked up. The clouds had drifted away and with all the electricity gone, there were more stars than he had ever seen in his life. Stars strewn out in such a mass that they looked like shimmering silver clouds. Look, Justin, he said. Look at all the stars. God, Justin whispered. And then he was gone. When the water receded later that week, Asher drove through Cumberland Valley to check on the members of his congregation and his neighbors. Most of the bridges had washed out, replaced with piles of brush and twisted guardrails, stoves, recliners, <coughs> chunks of sheet rock that had once been the walls of homes. The county roads had buckled under the weight of the water and were now undulating strips of blacktop that occasionally broke away. The bottom land along the river had morphed into ponds, pocked with john boats carrying people trying to find their belongings. Down near Green's Branch, two men in a wobbly rowboat nearly tipped over as they pulled a body on board. They were out in the middle of a cornfield and did not seem real until Asher caught sight of the corpse, a man whose clothes had been ripped away by the water, his side gashed open. He tried to pray, but could not find it in himself to do so. He watched as his neighbors trod the soaked ground or waded the water picking amongst the debris to see if there was anything that held some semblance of before the flood. Picture albums whose photographs had miraculously not been destroyed, a stuffed animal, a pistol still in its lockbox. At the water's edge, he found Roscoe. The dog's coat was so matted with mud that Asher didn't know him at first. But when he put his hand on Roscoe's head and felt the familiar shape of his skull, he knew. Oh, buddy, Asher said, squatting down. Roscoe's red collar had been ripped off, but it was certainly him, their good boy, who had watched over Justin his whole life. Asher was overcome by a kind of grief he had not felt before, a feeling more like injustice. He carried Roscoe over to a patch of pine woods and buried him with the shovel he had been using to dig out his neighbor's belongings, and he cried over the dog over all the laws. But again, he could not pray and felt no sense of that kind of prayer anywhere in him. He had spent his life finding words to make himself and others feel comforted. Always before the words were right there without having to think much about them. Perhaps that had been the problem all along. So, Asher knelt and put his hand on the wet ground. Roscoe, you were the best old boy that ever was, he said. Thank you. That was the kind of prayer, he supposed. There were different kinds of prayer and different kinds of belief, and he might be able to figure all that out someday, but not right now.
I'm sorry to uh, do that, to, to read such a sad passage to you. But everything you need to know about the novel is being set up there. And one thing that, I always hesitate to say this, but I've been saying it everywhere I go. Um, as novelists, people often ask me about symbolism and metaphors, and I never uh, really consciously insert symbolism or metaphors. I think, for me, that's something that arises organically. And when I go back and read the book and do my revision, I start to notice that. And I might turn the volume up a little bit on that, but if it's not, if it doesn't happen naturally, then it usually doesn't work. So when I began to realize, uh, as I was reading this book for, I don't know, a hundred times, or how many times I read it during revisions, um, dogs are always representative of the divine throughout the book. So there's a missing dog, there's a found dog, etc., etc. So uh, if you've read the book, I, it might make you think about that in a new way. If you haven't read the book, maybe it'll add a, another layer to it. But that's one reason I like to read that scene, because to me it's so much about this man who is really um, questioning what he really believes in. And I think, too, I think that not enough, but I don't think we do that enough. I think that I know for myself, for a lot of years, I just sort of blindly walked through the world believing what everybody else told me to believe. And when I started to examine what I really believed, I was surprised by what I really believed, you know? Um, and so I wanted to write about a character like that. Um, as the book has come out, uh, several people have asked me and have criticized me um, that it's a book um, from a straight man's point of view, and <clears throat> but, but that also deals so much with uh, gay issues. My, my response to that is that, um, first of all, I think novelists must always write the point of view that is presented, that the story presents to them. But more than that, I wanted to write a book in which the gay person is content and happy with who they are, and that makes for a really boring main character. <laughs> if the main character needs to be really troubled, you know, and trying to figure things out. So my gay character is really happy in his life, and he, um, you know, he knows who he is. There are two people in the book who know exactly who they are, and he's one of them. The other one is a, a little boy that's nine years old. He knows himself so much that he creates his own theology. So the other thing that I want to do in the book, and now I'll turn it over to you, is that's also, I think, shown here, is I really wanted to examine the full spectrum of belief and doubt, you know, everything in between non-belief and belief. Um, and so each character in the book is representing a, a point on that spectrum, all the way from a fanatic, uh, a fanatic Christian who pulls a gun, who holds a gun to her son's head because he's gay, to try to scare the gay out of him, um, all the way to a little boy who creates his own theology, you know, his own idea of God, and then also a character who doesn't believe in anything, you know, two characters somewhere in the middle and all that. So I really wanted to look at all that and really try to challenge myself to not make anybody into a caricature. It's harder to do with some characters than others, you know? And it's the hardest characters to write are the ones you disagree with the most, but they're also the most interesting to write, and the ones that, that I enjoy writing the most. Um, so those are some of the things I was trying to do in the book. Um, so I'm interested in, in what you all want to talk about. Anybody want to start us off? Yes. What was the hardest character for you to write? <laughs> the hardest character for me to write is the uh, wife who turns away the gay couple. Just because everything that she says is, she, I disagree with everything she says. All the way from the way she raises her child, you know, like that line where she says, you know, little boy shouldn't cry and going like that, you know. Um, but what's interesting about her is in writing her and trying to not make her a character, I had to really find the love that she had in, a, in saying something like that. And when she says that to him, it's because she wants to protect him. She knows how the world is, you know? So it's not coming from a mean place, although, you know, she's the antagonist. But 
uh, I found I had to really search for uh, <coughs> what made her vulnerable for her not to be a character. And what I found was what I always think about people who are, um, that tend to be uh, really judgmental, discriminatory things like that, it's that she's afraid. You know, she's afraid of everything. And so there's a vulnerability in that, even if I don't disagree with that figure, you know? Um, so that made her really interesting. Um, she disappeared, she's not in the novel for a long, long time. She's at the beginning. And so I, I really wanted to go back to her briefly. And so she does show up again so that I can show some evolution in her, but not too much. Because the people I know like that, I mostly don't have it, don't change that much. I mean, I'm writing about all the people I know on that spectrum, you know? I was raised in a fundamentalist church, so I, I felt really comfortable writing from this fundamentalist preacher's point of view. And also, as somebody who was, you know, evangelical and believed deeply in the church I grew up in, and somebody who started to question those things, that's what he's doing too. And there's nothing that's more uh, revoking in the evangelical church than to question stuff. You know, every, you're supposed to accept that's God's will, God moves in mysterious ways, etc. You yeah. know. What else? Y'all gonna be quiet? You weren't quiet before. <laughs>
and suddenly I become Asher in that moment. I think, how does Asher react to this? And so there's a scene in the novel, you know, where he's in a, a little gas station and a cop comes in. So I had to, you know, I had to experience that myself. Um, I did a lot of research about kidnapping cases, especially uh, parental kidnapping. When I first started writing the book, it was a mother who had kidnapped the little boy. But we react so differently to hearing about a father kidnapping a child versus a mother kidnapping a child that I thought that made it much more interesting to have it be a father. And then when I figured out he was a preacher, it just all made sense. Um, I wrote this book over about eight years, and so it was a long process. I wrote another book in that time, same as I'm here. But um, I was with these characters for a long time, and I felt like I really got to know him in the way he would react to that. But I always wanted to write a book about people on the run. I always loved books and movies. Like one of my favorite movies is Pick the Moon, Down in the Leaves, um, Flying Clyde. You know, I've loved those movies for a long time. And books too. Um, yes. Did you have other books or writers that were important to you in terms of writing this or figuring out some aspect of some challenge you were having with the book? Or yeah. Or, uh, yeah, I always have that. sort of like, I think it is almost like a palette that I'm thinking of, you know, I mean, not colors, obviously, but just people who are totally affecting it kind of. And the big one is Thomas Merton. And I mean, he shows up all throughout the book. It's a very Mertonian book. I mean, um, sort of one of the theses of the book is everything it is is holy, which Merton popularized, but of course, uh, William Blake really broke that. Yeah. Um, and Merton's referenced a few times. I watched a lot of Ingmar Bergman films. He does a lot of doubt and belief, you know, things like that, especially if they don't come into life. Look, I look at a lot of photographs, read a lot of poetry. I especially read Key West poets like Luther Bishop and Wallace Stevens. I read Tennessee Williams. Anybody who had a Key West connection? Um, so I love that part of the process. You know, and I, music is my big thing. If anybody's interested, if you're reading the book or if you've read the book, there are two soundtracks on Spotify. If you just look on Spotify, one's called Southernmost, one's called More Southernmost. <laughs> <laughs> I had so many, there were like a hundred songs I went on there. Um, so subscribe to those because I add songs to them occasionally. Yeah. Well, this will be a good question to find that. Uh, so uh, I'm curious about the dog. Consciously named the dog after Roscoe Holcomb. Um, at Roscoe Holcomb is somebody that was a big uh, inspiration on my second novel, Parchment Leaves. I listened to him a lot while I was writing that, but I didn't. I didn't think about him consciously. But I did love him. Um, I just love that name, Roscoe. One of my best friends has a dog named that, and I just thought it worked perfectly for this. Oh, and to uh, cap on with that last uh, answer, I just want to point out that Jim James, uh, Mama and Jagger, was a big influence on this book. The little boy in the book thinks that Jim James' voice is the voice of God. And so <laughs> Jim James loves that. And so because of that, he let me use one that I hope not because of that, because he's a really nice person. He let me use a whole song in the book. You know, it's called Honest Man, which is a favorite of mine. What was that question over here? Yes. Well, I think the thing is, is, I mean, it sounds so simple. I mean, obviously, I should have known this, but the book just solidified to me that in this great divide that we're in, things are always so much more complicated when we sit down individually with each other versus when we think about a whole culture or a whole this bubble or that bubble to some degree. But then there's a certain line where I just sign off. I'm like, if you're supporting this, this, and this, I'm done. 
and I can't have that conversation with you anymore, you know? And I started out riding the boat thinking that I would be able to find more grace in that sort of vision. Maybe it's just where I am right now and everything that's out in the world, but on, to be really honest with you, I am struggling to find that grace with some people. And um, that line is real clear to me in a way that it didn't used to be. You know, used to, I think, uh, and I hate to say that. Uh, you know, I wish I could say, we all just sit down and talk to each other, but I don't know. I've tried that. It doesn't even work with my cousins, you know. We just end up screaming each other. So, yeah. other questions? I'll try to make this one more positive. <laughs>
figure out how to write about gayness. Yeah, I mean, I'm gay. And the books that came to me just were never really, they never were about that. And I just didn't want to write another coming out story, you know, and um, so this is the first, I have short stories that deal with that content, but this is the first novel that it just, it seemed to work, and it seemed to do what I wanted to do. And I guess a big part of it was, you know, just leading up to marriage equality, that was, you know, for years and years it was a topic. Um, and I just, uh, I never thought that would happen in my lifetime. I never ever thought that I would be married in, my, in Kentucky. Um, <clears throat> and I was married in Kentucky five days after the Supreme Court decision, you know. So, um, it was just the right time for this book, I guess, for me. Um, and I think that's the way books work, you know, what, whatever piece of writing, it just, it, it, it happens when it happens. And I think that writers, you know, it's a balance in that, because on one hand we have to pay so much attention to instruction and what we're learning and all that, but we also pay a lot of attention to our instinct, you know, that does is so important to the creative process. Yeah. Uh, can you, you, you started the talk by saying that you've been having a little criticism about what you was allowed to do to you write a screen character. That that seems obviously like to be an issue in the moment we're in. To, you know, white artists make a painting about it until mm -hmm. who can write it and who can make work about what. Can you talk a little bit about that feeling of pressure or freedom mm -hmm. to move where you'd like to move, or what kind of? Spirit of who's watching all of that and policing it? Like, how's it mm -hmm. feel right now? For me, I think it's a case by case thing that you have to look at. And I think it's pretty easy to, I don't know, to look at a piece of art and see intention. And I don't know. I mean, for instance, you know, Barbara King's over a book called Lacuna that's from a gay man's point of view. And she received some criticism for that. That's my favorite book of hers, you know? I thought she did a great job with that book in that point of view. Um, and I'm glad that she wrote it. I would have hated for her to be kept from doing that. On the same token, there were some things that I don't think I can ever, I would not attempt to do some things because I, I just couldn't, I um, can't think of the right word, but, I just couldn't presume to understand that fully, you know? I cannot know what it's like to walk through the world as this, 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 and even as a novelist, that's part of my job is to imagine those things, but there's just, there's certain lines that I think that I, 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 I don't want to cross, that I don't want to do, but at the same time, I don't want to live anybody else from doing that. I think any kind of censorship is a really dangerous thing. Um, and I, I, I think this goes back to a case-by-case -case basis for me. Yeah. I mean, privilege is such a, especially unchecked privilege is such a dangerous thing, you know? And it's so dangerous when a writer or any, when any kind of artist just assumes that they can fully understand that. Because there's just some privileges that don't allow us to fully understand that. You know? I've written t two books from a woman's point of view. Um, and I think I mostly did that because I was raised around female storytellers. They were the people who told the stories. And um, they were the most interesting people to me, et cetera, et cetera. Um, I don't know if I would do that now. I don't know, I, in the same way. Um, some of it is cultural and some of it is just who I am. So I don't know, that's an awful answer. <laughs> <laughs> we'll go five more minutes and I'll let y'all out of here. I have a question. Yeah. So I know you're still living in the world of seven brothers and congratulations on all the success and uh, the LA Festival and all that. Mm -hmm. Well, I'm writing this really weird novel I'm almost finished with that, um, I don't want to say it's the 
dystopian because that's such a cliche now. So I'm calling it a parable. And, um, it's a parable for the Syrian refugee crisis. And so basically, a, an American family is on a boat, uh, and the last country that will affect Americans is Ireland. And so, um, <laughs> and so um, it ends up this one boy is walking across Ireland alone. Um, so I'm still figuring it out, and um, I don't know what will happen with it. I'm also writing a novel that I've just started to like, research and lay the foundation for that. I've been thinking about it a while. Um, I want to write a contemporary uh, retelling of Howard Zinn. You know, Howard Zinn, I think, is just such a uh, perfect look at class. So I want to write an American contemporary version of that. Of course, you know, then race will have to be part of that. I mean, you can't have that class by talking about race. So I'm figuring out how I'm going to do that. It sort of goes back to what you're asking to do, because I'm going to be delving into that a little bit, but I have to figure out exactly how I'm going to do that. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, thank you. One more? Yes. Uh, I read the cold tattoo first. No, that's the only book of mine that hasn't been an option for, for film. But, you know, none of them have become films. <laughs> so, wow, I just sold the film rights to sell the most. And, you know, on one hand, I'm excited about that. On the other hand, well, that'll never happen. Because you know, it never happens to Elgin's. But, um, but it's nice to imagine that. I mean, I love film so much. And film is such a big part of my process as a writer. I, um, Almost always when I write a novel, before I would go into revision, I write a screenplay of it, too. Mm -hmm. And that really helps me in revision, too, mm -hmm. about uh, the stealing and things like that. Um, so yeah, if anybody else has any questions, I'd love to answer them one-on-one. -on -one. I'll be right here. You don't have to buy a book. Just come ask me a question. Just come talk to me. I'll be glad to visit with you. Thank you all so much for being here.